David didn't even know he was down there. I, t I saw David this afternoon. I believe that clock's a little fast. Good evening. Turn to number 305. We're not going to get very far from there. 305. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Go ahead and turn back two pages. Go to 301. <clears throat> I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed 
what he saith, do what he willeth. He is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, bones may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Bill Winfrey, would you open us tonight, please? Amen. Thank you, Brother Bill. Well, tonight we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 10, but we're going to actually start in chapter 9. So if you'll be turning in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 9, while you're turning there, let me just help us to keep everything in context. You remember the Israelites are still at Mount Sinai. God, back in Exodus, gave Moses in great detail that we went through for, for weeks and weeks. Uh, the instructions for the tabernacle and all of its furnishings. And then he provided Bezalel and, and the, the workers to build the tabernacle. He gave great instructions on the, the garments that the priests were to wear. And, and so those were made. And so the tabernacle, its furnishings are built. The priest garments are, are made. Then you come into the book of Leviticus. And he tells them, okay, now that the tabernacle is built, here's the sacrifices that you're to make. And he gave great details about them. Uh, all five of the sacrifices, the burnt offering, the, pe- the grain offering, the peace offering the sin offering, and then the trespass offering. And that, that's chapters 1 through 7 of Leviticus. Then in chapter 8, which we're, we're not going to take a lot of time to look at, but in chapter 8, it was the consecration of the priests. And so now, chapter 9, we're ready for the worship at the tabernacle to actually begin. They're still there at Mount Sinai, and, and worship's about to happen. And it was an awesome thing as worship was instituted because uh, the, the fire for the very first offering and that fire which would be continually kept lit after this was not lit by the priests. The presence of God literally fell upon that place and fire comes out from the presence of the Lord and and just obliterates, consumes the offerings that are upon the brazen altar. Uh, We find that in Leviticus chapter 9 beginning in verse 22. There, the, the end of the chapter there. It says, And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And here it is. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So, I mean, this you talk about a a worship meeting. I mean, the the glory of the Lord falls on that place. And the fire of God comes out and consumes the, the, the sacrifices on the altar. And the people fall on their faces before God and they are shouting. It was an awesome sight what happened. And so as, as worship is now instituted at the tabernacle, I mean, it's, it's exactly as God has designed. They followed everything to, to the letter of the law. Now as, as worship begins, I mean, it is good and it is wonderful. 
just like God had created a lot of other things and, and things started off good. When God created the world in, in Genesis, he looked at everything and saw it was good. When God brought Eve to Adam, then everything was very good. But it didn't take long for Adam and Eve to mess it up, did they? Uh, then you come to, you know, God says, all right, I'm going to wipe out the world. I'm going to start over with Noah and his family. And it didn't take long for people to mess it up again. Already by Genesis, that was Genesis chapter 9. By Genesis chapter 11, mankind's already building a tower at, at Babel uh, to do things their own way. Uh, we find when God brings that, he says, okay, I'm going to choose out a special people. In chapter 12 of Genesis, he chooses Abraham. And he says, if all the world's not going to follow me, I'm going to have a special people peculiar to myself I'll be their God. They'll be my people. And, and I'll bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. He says, Abraham, follow me to the place I'll show you. And when that day comes that, that the nation has been, or the Israelites have been made a nation. They're coming into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was, it was just as God intended. He, he gives them victory over their enemies. Didn't take them long to mess it up, did it? Before long, they're serving the false gods of Baal and Ashtaroth and, and other false gods, forsaking the Lord. Uh, but God, you know, he brings them through the period of the judges, getting their attention over and over again. And he finally brings them down to the period of the kings where, where David, a man after his own heart. I mean, he, God, through David, he puts to flight all of the enemies. He brings peace all around. He, he's conquered every nation around him. He's brought peace to the land. He's, he's calling the people to worship God and, and honor God. He, he lays out all the preparations for his son Solomon to build a magnificent temple. And so Solomon comes and he builds this amazing temple, you know, with great artistry and craftsmanship and just literally covered in gold and precious metals and, and whatnot. And, and everything was wonderful. Didn't take Solomon long to mess it up, did it? All right, before Solomon's life was over, he was already sacrificing his own children as offerings, burnt offerings to the false god Moloch and others. Uh, again, so quickly, we mess up the true worship of God. No sooner than, than you know, Jesus says, all right, I, I'm, he had planned from the beginning, I'm going to come and I'm going to set everything straight. And so Jesus himself, God in human flesh comes and he dies on that cross to pay the price for our sins and he establishes the church. And again, true worship, you know, it's, it's as it ought to be. And it didn't take long to mess that up, did it? Already, while the, the scriptures were still being written, while in the days of the apostles, they're already warning about wolves who are entering into the fold, about apostates and those who would, who would fall away from the faith and, and doctrinal error. Already it was there. And so we have a tendency as mankind to mess things up. And that's true at the tabernacle. You have this very specific uh, instructions. Everything's been followed. Now finally the, the worship at the tabernacle has begun and immediately it gets messed up. And it's Aaron's own two sons, oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, who do it. So chapter 10, verse 1. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So they said, we'll just do it our own way. We'll do worship on our own. And how does God respond to that? Yeah, verse boom is right. Verse 2, and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You say, wow, just for worshiping the wrong way? You know, maybe they, they meant well or they did How? Why would God do such a thing? Well, if you remember back when we first started Leviticus a few weeks ago, do you remember that most of the book of Leviticus, it's not a narrative story. It's almost all of the book. Who's, who's the one speaking? Listen how it starts off. It starts off very clearly uh, with God speaking. Le uh, Leviticus 1.1. 1, 1, and the Lord called unto Moses and spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. So from the very beginning, it's God says, Okay, here's what I'm... It's, it's direct address from God himself. In 27 chapters, we find 38 different times when it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and here's what he said. On top of that, you have 10 occasions where it says that as the Lord spoke to Moses or as the Lord commanded Moses, uh, 10 more times there. Leviticus ends in chapter 27, verse 34. It says, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel and Mount Sinai. These were all very specific commands of God himself from his own mouth. Chapters 1 through 7 give great detail about how the, the sacrifices are to be made. In chapter 8, when you come to the consecration of the priest, 
over and over again, God has commanded, and they're doing exactly as God has commanded. In chapter 8, verse 13, it says that they acted as God, as the Lord commanded. In verse 17, again, they did as the Lord commanded. Verse 21, again, as the Lord commanded. Verse 29, as the Lord commanded. Verse 34, it, it says, as the, as the Lord uh, didn't just command Moses, but as the Lord commanded to do. In verse 35, it says, as the I am, the great I am, has commanded. This is what they've done. And then in verse 36, it says, as the Lord commanded at the hand of Moses. God is not stuttering here. There's no stuttering. There's no stammering. There's nothing unclear. God himself is speaking and being very specific about what he wants. Very clear. Uh, no doubt about this. Now, we come, when we come to chapters 9 and 10, this is the only section of the whole book of Leviticus that is a narrative, that's a story. Everything else is God giving his commands. But here we pull back in chapters 9 and 10 and we see a story of something that happens. So in chapter 9, we see how God sends, God's presence comes, the, the time to initiate that worship at the tabernacle has come. Everything's ready, everything's in place. And that priests are consecrated, all's there. And how God comes and, and fire uh, comes from him, from him. You have three fires. You have the fire of God, the holy fire of God that, that starts and, and consumes the, the sacrifices on the altar. Then you have the strange fire that Nadab and Abihu offer. And then you have the judgment fire of God which comes and devours and kills Nadab and Abihu. But I want you to notice when this takes place. So the end of chapter 9, what did we read about? This is where the... the the presence of God comes, he, the fire falls and, and, and consumes the altar and the people fall on their faces and they're shouting and praising the Lord. Immediately after that, we come to chapter 10, verse 1. And if you look at them again, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, and so here's the setting. I mean, it's an amazing worship service, all this preparation through all this period of time, and now finally it's ready. God's showed up, the glory of the Lord is there. People are shouting and praising the Lord. And what do Nadab and Abihu do? It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now this strange fire, the word for strange is czar, which is the same word used of a harlot, a strange Woman. Psalms uses this, uh, the same word to speak of strange gods, false gods. He's saying they're, they're using a, a strange fire, a false, uh, false fire before the Lord. It's not what God had commanded them to do. And I like what someone has said. They said, any worship that God does not initiate, God does not appreciate. When we say, oh God, we know what you've told us to do, but we're going to do our own thing and you'll be pleased with that. Remember old Cain, how that worked out for Cain in, in the story of Cain and Abel? God says, do it this way. And we say, oh, what? we're going to do it our own way. And you'll love that too, won't you, God? Oh, no. The worship that God does not initiate, God does not appreciate. I think maybe what happened here, this is an amazing event that's taking place. Uh, you know, the fire of God has fallen. Aaron has, and Moses have come out of the, the tabernacle and this fire comes and Aaron has been exalted. And I think Nadab and Abihu think, man, we want to get in on this. Let, let's, get, let's get in the middle of this ourselves and we'll be, in the, we'll be exalted and look at us. And so they go and they get their, their censers, they light their own fires and they go in to offer their own incense. But true worship has to come from God. Adrian Rogers pointed out when he talked about this passage, and, I, and he's right. He says there's three things about true worship. That if it's going to be true worship and right worship, it, it, has to, it absolutely uh, has to have the right mandate. It has to be God who initiates. It's the way God says to do it. It has to have the right motive. What's our motive behind it? And it also has to have the right method. It, it has to have the right mandate. It has to come from God. When we look to the world to determine how we ought to worship God, which I would dare say is happening. And, you know, you can debate different music styles. That's not my point here. But, but I would dare say that, well, I'm not even going to give a percentage. I'm not even going to guess. But a lot of churches are determining their style and methods of worship based solely on appealing to the world around them. I mean, literally, one of the, you know, a great hero in our convention, a, a hero of some, he's, he's now, I think, even left the convention, 
He's decided he wants women preachers at his church, and that just doesn't fly. So probably next year at the convention, he'll be out of the convention. But um, that doesn't fly in Baptist churches anyway, uh, biblically. But that being said, you know, his, his method, which was promoted, you know, ad nauseum uh, amongst the Southern Baptist Convention was, you know, go out and find out what, you know, you want to grow a church it's all about pragmatism, what works, not what's right. But, but you go out and you go out in your community and you say, hey, what, do a survey. Find out what kind of music they like. If everybody in your community really loves country music, well, then you find some Christian music with a country twang, and that's the music you play in your church. Or if, you know, if your church you know, likes you know, more of a hip-hop kind of sound, well, then find some songs that are more of a hip-hop sound and go that way. Or, or if you're just whatever music that the world around you likes, well, then that's the kind of music you ought to have in your church. Here's the problem. Who's determining the style and the form of worship? Where, 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 where's our focus? If we're looking to the world, lost people in the world, to determine how we worship God, worship is not about appealing to the world. Worship is about pleasing God. Love not the world nor the things of the world that the this world is passing away in the lust thereof. We're not here to appease the world. We're here to please the Lord. That's what worship is about. Our worship is, is not about evangelism. Evangelism, it, it, absolutely, we need to be as tactful and gracious and whatnot as we go out to reach the world. But our worship of God should not be determined by lost people. God tells us how to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that's the key of worshiping God. Our worship has to be has to be, now, that doesn't mean that our worship has to be somber, that you have to be old high church and you can never sing songs that are upbeat or whatever. You know, certainly not. I mean, think about what's happening here. When the fire falls in Leviticus 9.24 there, what, what are the people doing? When the glory of the Lord shows up, are the people quiet? Well, number one, when the glory of the Lord shows up, people fall on their face in reverence before God. By the way, they don't fall back in some kind of being slain in the spirit. That is such a falsehood. That is absolutely not in scripture. And if that offends anybody to hear it, I would just appeal to you, turn to scripture and show it to me. That's a falsehood of the, of the faith healers and the, those kind of folks. When people come into the genuine presence of God, they don't, uh, the only people who fall back in the presence of God are his enemies. You remember Gethsemane? When he said, I am, they fell back. But I'm going to tell you, the followers of God, when they come into the presence of God, we don't fall back. We fall flat on our face in reverence and humility before the glory of the Lord. So they fall on their face because the glory of the Lord has shown up. But they're not quiet. They're shouting, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, they, they're excited. God is in this place. And they're not quiet about it. They're excited about that. Uh, but here's the thing. You know, it's not wrong to say, to say hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen. It's not wrong to raise your hands in worship and those kind of things. But here's the thing. Have you ever noticed that sometimes folks get real excited about hollering and shouting in the service or raising their hands? Sometimes, I'm just, this is a Sunday night, so I'm just going to, if you're watching online, I may get in trouble for this. But I'm just going to tell you. Have you ever gone to these interdenominational meetings and, and, you know, there's some folks that, well, even some Baptists think, you know, oh, they've got a, I'm not here to judge motives. I think, you know, raising your hands in worship is not a bad thing. But there are some people that, like you go, they get to singing. You go to a singing and you'll have people up there and they're just, oh, you know, their hands are up in the air and they're doing, you know, and oh, you know. And what gets them to throw their hands in the air, sometimes I think it's like, hey, look at me, I'm real spiritual. I do think that's the attitude of some people. I'm just being honest here. And the way you can tell that is because when their hand gets thrown up in the air and they suddenly, you know, feel the spirit has nothing to do with the message of the song. It's when the music gets really loud, the hand throws up. Or when the, when the, when the musician hits a really long, hard note, oh, praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what they're singing, it's just the music. I had a, we had a friend, in a, he was a deacon in a church that, uh, of ours that he, said, he used to play the drums and he had a singing group and they would, a Christian group and they would travel around. And he said, he said you know the reason I quit playing drums he said, because I, I noticed we would go to these different churches. And, and he said, I would watch it. He said, I'd get to really playing the drums and getting into it. And he said, man, those people just, man, they'd start hopping and hollering and shouting. And he said, and then I'd back off and get real easy on the drums. He said, they'd calm down. He said, I'd get real loud on the drums. And man, they were up and shouting. And he said, I could just manipulate them up and down and up and down with what I was doing. It had nothing to do with the Spirit of God. It was just how hard I was beating on that drum. Look, emotion without devotion is nothing but commotion. That's all it is. 
What God is looking for is our heart. The day is coming when true worshipers must worship how? In spirit and in truth. So it's okay to shout. It's okay to throw your hands in the air. That, that's okay. But here's the thing. It has to be genuine. It has to be real and not just a show. Uh, we have to be very careful about that. Because sometimes, can you worship with the wrong motive? Was there a Pharisee who stood outside the temple and prayed real loud so everyone could hear, I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like these other sinners. Now, who is he doing it to be seen of? When There are a lot of folks who will worship to be seen of men. God's looking for the one whose heart is right. And so our worship has to be genuine, not, not something for outward display, not for something for outward uh, pe- people to notice. Our, our focus ought not be on others. I, I think... We have to be very, very careful about our motive and, and how we worship. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Some of us don't, don't have the greatest voices in the world. Some of y'all do, and some of us don't. But when I hear a choir sing, or I hear someone stand, you know, here on this platform and sing, or anywhere else, you know, sometimes you could say, boy, they are, they are out of tune with the instruments. They're off pitch. You know, that's not the worst thing that you could say about someone. I think sometimes we get so busy focused on the performance because we're, we're performing to an audience out here rather than an audience up here. Something far worse than not being in tune with the instruments is not being in tune with God. Something far worse than being off pitch is singing to the wrong audience. I think sometimes we get focused on the quality of the sound of the music because we're wanting to, to appeal to this audience rather than making sure our hearts are in tune up here and appealing to Him. That's where worship should genuine, true worship. We need to have the right motive. But we also have to have the right method. Strange fire that God had not commanded. So what really was the gist of what all that Nadab and Abihu had done? What was so terrible about this? Well, if you want to, you're, you're, if you want to flip over to Leviticus chapter 16, just a few more chapters. In chapter 16, verse 1, it tells us about their, their, they were in the wrong spot. Hey, when you didn't just walk back into the presence of the Lord. Where was the presence of the Lord in the Holy of Holies? Leviticus 16.1 says, The Lord spoke unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron your brother, and that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. So he's saying, look, Nadab and Abihu went back there and they got struck dead. You make sure Aaron knows you don't just come back here or you will die. There was also something about there, you can hold your finger there in uh, verse, chapter 16, but if you look back in chapter 10, it, it gives us another clue about the state of Nadab and Abihu. They were celebrating and whatnot. This was a special day as they were instituting the worship there in the tabernacle. And it, the implication is that they had probably been imbibing in some things they shouldn't have been imbibing. That they were not thinking as clearly as they ought to have been thinking. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8 says, The Lord spoke unto Aaron saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that you may put differences between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. I think the implication there is Nadab and Abihu were in a a kind of a drunken state when they just kind of went off on their own. They weren't thinking clearly like they should in following God. They were doing their own thing. Thirdly, they had a, not only did they have their, they were in the wrong location and they were in a state of drunkenness, but they were also, their their offering, their offering was a fight with a fire of their own making. Now, Scripture was very clear that they were to take fire from off the altar. This was holy fire that had come from the very presence of God. And they were to take fire from off of the brazen altar where God had started it that was to be kept continually lit. And they were to take that and go into the, into the holy place, the front room of the tabernacle, and to offer the, the incense there on the altar of incense with the fire that had come from the burnt offering. The fire that, that represented a sacrifice has been made, a blood sacrifice on that brazen altar. Well, they came in with a fire that didn't come from the blood sacrifice. Back in Leviticus chapter 16, if you look in verses 12 and 13, it, says, it gives specific instructions. He shall take a censer full of burning coals from the fire 
off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. But that fire, to, to go into the presence of the Lord, it had to come from off of the altar. This was a fire of their own making. Uh, this false worship goes all the way back to the very beginning. This whole idea of a bloodless religion. We don't need the, the fire that comes from the blood sacrifice. All, all the way back to uh, Cain and Abel. But you can see, you know, there's all these isms. You know, you've got Confucianism and Buddhism and Mohammedism and rheumatism, as some say. But I mean, all these isms. And then you have Christianity. But even within Christianity, you know, you've got Baptists and Methodists and Disciples of Christ and Church of God and Church of Christ and Episcopalians. And, you know, you can go right on down the list. But there's really, when you get down to it, there's only two kinds of religion. It's either true religion or it's false religion. Either it's true or it's false. Cain and Abel, you know, Cain says, I want the bloodless religion. I, I want to do my own thing. I mean, he probably brought in, you know, the, the best of his produce that he had grown. I mean, it was the kind of thing you could have been, entered at the county fair and it would have, you know, won the blue ribbon. But God says, no, that's a bloodless sacrifice. That's not what I asked for. God's very clear. Hebrews 9, 22, he says, without the, remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In Jude, one, uh, well, Jude 11, it says, Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. They've tried to make up their own religion apart from the shedding of blood, which pointed to Jesus. No blood sacrifice, no fire from off of the altar uh, of, the, of the burnt offering. So what do, what do we take from the story of Nadab and Abihu? We really ought to check ourselves and make sure that our worship is genuine and true. Is it the worship that, that God has mandated? Is it what he's, how he's told us to worship in spirit and in truth? Is that our focus? Is our focus on him? Is our focus on the people we're, that are seated around us? Or the people, uh, where's our focus? Is it genuine and true worship? Does it have the right mandate from God? Are we ser- worshiping with the right motive? And are, are we using the right method? Really, you can bring it down to this. Are we coming to God on, our, on his terms or on our own terms? God's been very clear. We've been talking about that. He's the door. He's the way. Are we coming to him on his terms, the way he's made it abundantly open and clear to us? Or do we say, no, God, we're going to come to you on our terms. We don't get to dictate the terms. At the beginning of the worship of the tabernacle, God makes it, t- makes it very clear how seriously he takes his worship. I mean, he literally strikes Nadab and Abihu, the, the high priest's sons, Aaron's sons, dead to let us know he takes it seriously. When he instituted worship there in the city of Jerusalem where the temple would be built, again, God strikes someone dead. You remember as they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and Uzzah reaches out to steady the Ark because they were carrying it in on on an ox cart instead of carrying it on the pole by the the priest as God had commanded. They were coming to God on their terms. We can do it this way as well as that. No, God had been clear, do it this way. And what does God do? He strikes Uzzah dead. At the beginning of worship in the Christian church, what does God do again? Ask Ananias and Sapphira. God is serious about this. Now, does that mean that God's going to strike us dead if we, if we uh, worship, you know, and have the wrong motive or the wrong heart or something? Maybe God uses those at those, at those specific times as he institutes these, these different phases of worship to let us know how serious it is and uses those as an example. But certainly... It serves as an example to us. God takes it very, very seriously. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 1, we we read about Nadab and Abihu there. It says, He said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near before the Lord. So Nadab and Abihu were... These were special folks. This was Moses' nephews, Aaron's sons, his oldest two sons. They had gone up to Mount Sinai with the elders. And then in chapter 8, we find that, that these two are consecrated as priests. I mean, they are, Aaron's the high priest, and, and they're next in line, Nadab and Abihu. They had a, a very a special relationship that was there. But even as special as, there was, as special as they were being in the family of Moses, being part of the, uh, those uh, 70 elders, being the, right there in the priesthood, we have an even closer relationship with God than they did. I mean, we've got it better than they do because we've got 
because we're on this side of the cross and we have the Holy Spirit of God, we can go right in before that. They couldn't go before the Holy of Holies right into the presence of God without being struck dead. But we can, right? Hebrews tells us we can go boldly right before the very throne of God. When we, when we get on our knees spiritually and say, God, we, I mean, we can talk directly to God right there before Him. We're also consecrated as priests. They were priests, but so are we. We pointed this out several times that First Peter tells us, First Peter 2, 5, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. And Revelation 1, 6 tells us that he's made us a, a kingdom of priests. He's made us kings and priests. And so we have something, we're, we're in a much higher state, I would say, than Nadab and Abihu were. I mean, they were in a, in a special state and God judged them pretty seriously when they did things wrong. Absolutely he did. But they were Old Testament. You remember God says, or Jesus said, there was none greater born of, uh, born of women than John the Baptist. But anyone born in God's kingdom on that side of the cross was even greater than John the Baptist because of what we have that they didn't have being on this side of the cross. They were looking forward to the cross, but now it's already accomplished and we're on the other side. Nadab and Abihu were judged very seriously because they, had, they were in a very special position. They were in a very high position. Uh, God had given them specific instructions of what to do and had made it very clear. And so I'll leave you with this thought tonight and think about it very seriously. If God judged Nadab and Abihu very, very strictly because of the position they were in and how they did not handle it faithfully and do exactly as God said, and God strikes them dead, and we're in an even higher position than Nadab and Abihu, in the Gospel of Luke we're told, to whom much is given, much shall be what? Required. Yes, God had a high standard for Nadab and Abihu. He said, look, I put it in just as clear I have spoken directly to you and said do it this way he's put us in an even higher more responsible situation has he also given it to us just as clear as a bell in black and white and if we look anywhere else other than this book to determine how we are to worship to whom much is given much will be required sometimes I wonder if God's judgment on our nation, which I think it is on our nation for sin. I mean, I can't imagine how it couldn't be. Sometimes I wonder if God's judgment isn't also on our churches. Because for years now, we've been looking to pragmatic approaches and looking all out in the world and, and looking to conferences and different things. Oh, this is the way to get more, more, you know, backsides in the pews and money in the plate. And, let's, and, and following a pragmatic approach, coming to God on his own terms rather than just opening up the word of God and saying, God, how do you want us to worship so much has been given to us as Christians in America oh man we've got more blessings than, than any group of Christians perhaps in the history of Christianity to whom so much has been given much shall be required if God would judge Nadab and Abihu for looking in the wrong ways and doing worship the wrong way how could he not also judge us if we look anywhere other than to the word of God, to his clear commands, and say, God, we're coming to you on your terms, and we'll be faithful to you. And thus says the Lord. That is our mandate. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I do thank you that you have made your word so clear to us and you have blessed us beyond uh, anything that we could ever even ask for as Christians in America. Surely we face tribulation just like anyone else does in this old sin-cursed world. But oh, we have been given so much. But we're reminded that just like Nadab and Abihu who were in such a privileged position, that to whom much is given, much shall be required. So help us to be faithful to do as you have commanded and to, to hide your words in our hearts so we would know your way and we would recognize the falsehoods and the, the tricks of the devil and the ways of the world that, that sound so good but that really are just getting us off track of what your clear mandates have been. Help us to focus on you and your word and to trust you and to worship you as you have commanded. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. It's time for our hymn of decision. There may be public decisions that need to be made tonight, and I want you to have that opportunity. So if you would stand to your feet while Brother Ken leads us, if you need to make a public decision tonight, right now is the time. Turn to number 309, Lord, I'm coming home. I've won far away Now I'm coming home The paths of sin too long I've trod Lord, I'm coming home Coming home, coming home Nevermore to roam Open wide thine arms above Lord, I'm coming home As always, I say this every Sunday night, but I'm so grateful that you're here tonight. Uh, Thank you for coming so we can study the the book of Leviticus together and to to hear from God tonight. Uh, Wednesday night, it's family night and ladies of grace uh, helping with uh, decorations and whatnot. So be be prepared, be planning to be here. Had a, uh, well, Brother Doug's not here to to share with us, but um, had 108 in Sunday school this morning. So praise the Lord. As we see those numbers kind of coming back up, and some of that may be due to people feeling more comfortable getting back out and whatnot, but uh, I think the opportunities for us to reach out to folks are getting much, much easier, much more open now. And so we praise the Lord for that. So find somebody, invite them to come to Sunday school, invite them to, to be here in church with you. In fact, whoever you sat next to this morning that's not with you tonight, next Sunday morning, just, just hit them in the elbow. When I say something about the Lord's day being the Lord's day and not the Lord's morning, just take your elbow and go, ugh. <laughs> Would you do it? (laughs) Say, I'll be here if you'll be here. Well, you're going to be here anyway. So just say, I'll be here if you will. uh, And encourage others uh, to be gathered together. Whether it be our Sunday opportunities or Wednesday as well. God gives us, uh, it's wonderful we have these opportunities. Uh, So let's encourage others to take advantage of them too. All right, let's pray together as we're dismissed. Our Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for your word and uh, just something we can come and, and, and learn from and the ability to be able to sing your praises and to, to do that together, to lift our voices in one accord and to pray in one accord and just to know there's, there's something very special uh, where, uh, to, where we're gathered together in your name. And so we, we thank you for the, the blessing that's been ours to do that and to gather this day. We pray that you'd help us to be faithful as we go back out to our various uh, areas of life and responsibilities. I pray that you'd help us to continue to shine our lights brightly wherever we are, that there'd be no doubt that we are your children and that we're pointing to you. So help us to to shine brightly this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.